Pterodactyl here, and today I'm going to tell you what it takes to start your own lawnmower business. So let me give you a little background into how me and my brother Farrell grew up. We grew up in the garage. We were constantly in the garage working on stuff, mini bikes, motorcycles. We loved doing that kind of stuff. So to be a grass rat, a true grass rat, you got to have this small engine stuff in your blood like we had. When I was in fourth grade, I put a tr uh, engine on a tricycle. My brother Farrell went to the local drag strip, came back and said that, yeah, I was at the drag strip and there was a guy there and he had a tricycle with an engine on it and he was running it up and down the drag strip. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. So I went out in the garage and put an engine on a tricycle. And my brother Farrell came home and he saw that thing we were working on in the garage, me and my buddy David, and he said, that thing ain't never gonna work. And he laughed it off. And then an hour later, we were driving it around and he's like, let me ride that thing. Let me take that thing for a ride. And he took off on that thing and was gone for about an hour. We are gonna do a video on that. I have everything we need to recreate that. So we're gonna do a video on that at some point. So like a lot of people, we didn't have a lot of money. So we couldn't take our cars and motorcycles and mini bikes to places to get them fixed. So, you know, we had to learn how to fix all this stuff ourselves. My father was a TV repairman. That's what he did for a living. He used to fix people's TVs. He worked at a regular shop that did that. And then you know, maybe that's where some of this mechanical knowledge came from because we learned a lot from him. And then, like I said, we didn't have a lot of money, so we would have to figure out how to fix stuff ourselves. So my brother Farrell would buy motorcycles and fix them himself and mini bikes and cars. And uh, he had a job where he worked for somebody else. And on his lunch break, he would drive around on his motorcycle. And he happened to drive by this mower shop that was for sale. And then that's back in 1978 when he uh, borrowed $12,000 and then opened his own uh, lawnmower shop. And that's when I came and went and worked for him. 17 years old, still in high school. So I started working for him from 78 to 85. And then I went off, worked some other jobs but then ended up coming back to his shop in 2004 to 2008 because I had intentions on opening my own repair business and he said that he would help me any way he could. So I started out slow. I had to build a customer base where I lived and I had the help of our local hardware store because they were selling equipment, but they didn't have anybody to repair it. So under his suggestion that I work out of my home to build a customer base, so that way I wouldn't have to go and get loans for large amounts of money that I'd have to pay back. This way I would already have a customer base built up, and then over that time, I could uh, start to stock parts and acquire different equipment and tools so that when I got a regular brick and mortar building to move into, uh, I wouldn't have such a cold start at getting started. I would already have built it up. So that, that helped me by getting hooked up with a local hardware store. So what, what they would do there is they would take equipment in and then after I worked all day at my brother Farrell's shop, I'd have to come home and pick up the equipment at the hardware store and take it to my house and fix it and then deliver it. Plus I was running a, uh, a small ad in our local paper for mower repair, so that helped too. So there was sometimes uh, I'd come home from work and I'd have maybe 13 lawn tractors I'd have to repair. And then I would be out in my garage 
working on that stuff, you know, till 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, and then have to get up early the next day and drive an hour each way from my home to my brother Farrell's shop. And I did that for four years. So that's another thing when you start a business. You gotta be prepared to work. Just don't think you're just gonna be the boss and tell other people what to do and just collect the money. There's a lot to it in this business, especially if you're gonna sell new equipment. So now you gotta sell equipment, you gotta stock parts, you gotta have employees, and especially if there's, these employees are gonna be mechanics, they gotta know what they're doing because that's part of your reputation. They don't know how to fix stuff. It's gonna get around that. Yeah, you don't wanna take nothing there. Them guys over there, they don't know what they're doing. So you gotta have some kind of smarts to it. Anybody can just have a big dealership and just kinda try to tell you, well, you need a new mower, you need a new mower. And that's because they don't know how to fix it. That's why they're trying to sell you a new one all the time or they don't have the qualified help there. So there's a lot. To know it's just not like auto repair auto repair is a whole different animal than this you know you're just working on cars and even you know granted there's a lot to know about cars but this kind of business you got to know about weed eaters chainsaws leaf blowers new equipment old equipment you know why why is it doing this why is it doing that you got to figure all that stuff out so there's a lot to know so after I felt that I had my business built up enough, my customer base at my home, then I was able to quit working for my brother Farrell and I went and found a place to rent. And that's the place I'm in now. So for five years I rented the building that we're in now. And the landlord uh, told me that if at any point I wanted to buy the building, he would sell it to me. So he just didn't want to keep it as a rental and just, you know, keep collecting income. He, he said, you know, I am willing to sell this building. So we ended up renting for five years and then uh, to make sure that things were going to, you know, go smooth, that we were going to be, you know, profitable. He didn't want to buy a building and get stuck with it and then have to turn around and sell it if for some reason the business didn't work out. So rent it for five years and then, uh, you know, got on our feet enough and then was able to buy the building. So I own this building now that we're in, and the trailer and everything that's on it. I own all that now. On the subject of parts for these machines, in order to get parts, you gotta have a regular business. So that requires you to have a resale tax ID from your state that you live in because you're gonna have to collect sales tax on these parts. Now Stens and Rotary in Oregon, they want you to show proof of that in order for you to sign up as a dealer from them and then they'll sell you the parts. That's how you get the parts. You have to be a dealer. Briggs, all them companies, you got to be a regular business that has a, a resale tax number because you're going to be reselling these parts and you're responsible to collect sales tax on it and give it to your state. So that's what you have to do to get the part. Now I'm fortunate enough that my brother Farrell is a big dealer because lately I've been finding myself buying more and more parts off the inner screen only because I'm not like a John Deere dealer and my brother Farrell's not a John Deere dealer. So if there's a dealer item I need that Stens or Rotary or Oregon doesn't have in their catalogs, I gotta get that from the dealer. Same with auto repair. When you go to the, the guy that's a local auto repair shop that works on all cars, you know, sometimes he runs into a problem where he's gotta get a dealer item. And usually them guys are hooked up with their local dealerships so they can call over there and get the part. But they're not gonna be getting the part at a discount. They're going to be paying the full price for that part and they're probably going to mark it up you know for you unless you have a shop that'll say well you need this part why don't you go over to Chevy dealer and pick it up 
and then I'll put it on. Same with the lawnmower business. You got to be a dealer in order to get parts for a lot of this equipment. And especially if it's a dealer item. You know, say you need a part for a scrub cadet and you're not a scrub cadet dealer and it's a dealer item. Some kind of plastic knob or something that broke on there. Well, you're either going to have to go on the air screen and buy it or you're going to have to go to your local cub dealer. But, like I said, my brother Farrell is a big dealer and he's got many brands he deals with but not all brands so I can get parts from him and if not then I have to go on the inner screen and buy them so that's how the parts thing works so if you want to dive into this and just be a repair shop like we are a lot of your income is also going to come from parts you got to sell parts but if you're doing it out of your house it's kind of hard to have people come to your house to buy parts. They want to go to a regular store, you know, a regular business. So when you have a regular building and you're advertising, you're going to have to sell parts because a large part of your income is going to come off, off the money you make on them parts. You know, nobody works for free. I know people that, that work at a regular job and punch a clock, your business that you work for, they make money. You know, they got to they gotta pay everybody plus make money to live on. That's how the world works. Everybody does. So, if you're going to jump into this, you got to be able to sell parts. Blades and air filters and spark plugs and oil and oil filters. People are going to want that stuff. So, you got to keep that in mind. If you want to, you know, you can make money repairing and just selling parts. But if you want to make more, even more money... You know, you're going to have to sell equipment too, and that can be tricky also. You don't want to take on too much equipment to sell because as a year goes by pretty quick, you know, you got to sell all that equipment. They're not going to take it back. If you're signed up, say, with Toro, and your Toro sales guy comes in, he's going to come by once a year and want to get an order for the following year. You know, this, he's going to come by in the wintertime and want a spring order. So you gotta kinda know what you can move. And that's another thing with stock and parts, you gotta kinda figure out what parts you're seeing a lot of. So you know what to stock, you know. Am I working on a lot of scrub cadets? Well, you might wanna stock a lot of scrub cadet spindles and belts and blades. But that all comes with knowing what to stock. So you have to kind of figure all that out as you're doing this year by year. One thing I know, when people come in my shop, because of our reputation, they always say, yeah, I hear, I hear you got the parts, Terrell. I went to that other guy and he didn't have it. And a friend of mine said, go see Terrell. He's probably got it. And sure enough, you had the part. So, you know, you're going to have to invest some money in, in inventory. So there's a lot to know and a lot to take in. But hopefully these tips will help you if you decide you want to do this kind of work. You want to start off slow. You want to start repairing and selling parts. And then if you start making money, then you might want to think about taking on a line of equipment to sell. You know, and if you have other mower shops in your area, you know, you don't want to sell maybe the same lines they're selling because then you're going to be in competition with that other guy. Well, I went over there and he had he was selling me that same tractor for this much and you know how much are you gonna sell it to me for? You know, you might want to sell a different line, or you can do that, sell the same line and go head to head with them. But some of these uh, mower companies have rules where you gotta be so many miles apart in order to sell their product too. So you gotta you gotta look into all that. But they'll help you with all that. But you know, you don't wanna get loaded up on equipment. And that you can't sell by the end of the year because I'm going to tell you something, they don't take it back. They give it to you and then you sell it. They give it to you like on consignment. And then as you sell it, you got to pay. You got to pay them for it. And then you keep your cut on how much you sold. You know, you, you're going to make money on it. So you get to keep that cut. So you're going to have to get a line of credit and stuff through a bank. Because sometimes, you know, you got to come up with that money. i seen my brother Farrell write checks for $100,000 before they have to pay some of these companies. 
So you got to keep all that in mind. There's a lot to it. Not just going in there and putting a spark plug in and getting it running. Y'all now got computers and you got this YouTube where you can go and learn how to fix stuff. Me and my brother Farrell, we didn't have all that stuff. We didn't have a go-to guy like Terrell that we went to. We didn't have anybody in our in our neighborhood or whatever that we could go to to learn how to fix stuff. We had to learn how to do all this stuff on our own. You know, of course our father would help us with his knowledge of what he knew on things, but for the most part, it just came with tinkering and trial and error and you know, that's how we learned how to do stuff. Again, like I explained to you a lot of times, you gotta, once you figure out how something works, you can fix it. Once you know how it works, that's how you are able to fix it. That's why you gotta be like lawnmower detective. That's why we do those lawnmower detective skits. Because that's what you have to be. You have to investigate and learn. You just don't throw parts at it, keep changing parts until you hit on one. You gotta sit there and think and you gotta figure it out. That's how you fix this stuff. That's how I fix stuff every day. There's stuff that comes in this shop every day that I've never worked on before. But because I know how things work, that's how I'm able to fix them. I did have some jobs where I bounced around and learned a lot of knowledge. I worked for 15 years for a company that made stamping presses that stamped out steel parts. Auto parts, washing machine parts, we built those machines. I worked in a great big giant factory that built them machines. We built them by hand. That's where a lot of my fabricating skills came in. 15 years of working at a place like that. I also worked at a place that made gantry cranes. Those gantry cranes like that lift I made. It's like a little rolling gantry crane. I worked at a place that made those and I worked in the department where we built the cabs that had all the electrical in there, the cameras and that, I used to wire up those cabs. You know, we had a, a schematic, electrical schematic, and a skid full of parts, and we'd have to wire it all together and build the cab. So that's where a lot of my electrical skills came in, working at a place like that. So I did bounce around and grab some skills here and there, but I always always worked on uh, small engines, especially those other places I worked. Once they learned that you knew how to fix lawnmowers and weed eaters, trust me, your coworkers are like, I got trouble with my lawnmower, I got trouble with my weed eater, you know how to work on that stuff. Fix it for me, Terrell. So I was always working on stuff. And then I would sometimes, uh, when uh, we would slow down at some of these factories, sometimes we wouldn't be working as many hours, I would go back and help my brother Farrell out. He was, you know, always said, hey, you ever got any downtime, you know, come and work. So I'd always bounce in and out, working on stuff for him too. So now let's talk about picking up and delivering equipment and labor rates. So if you're just starting out small, like I did, working out of your house and you want to take it to the next level, well, this is what I did. I called the local repair shops in my area and I acted like I was a customer and I said you know what are you trying for pick up and delivery I talked like a woman like that too on the phone I went hello hi I want to get my lawnmower picked up how much do you charge for pick up and delivery and they're like where do you live ma'am oh, I live in a shoe and they go you live in a shoe well, to pick up a mower at a house from a person who lives in a shoe is going to be $50 round trip. And I go, oh, $50, okay. All right, thank you. And, you know, and then you base it off of that. Because what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to undercut them guys. Because they have to charge that much because they have high overhead. And if you don't know what overhead is, that's the cost of doing business. You know, what it costs to keep the lights on, pay your employees, you know, all the utilities and stuff you have to pay at your business, your internet, your phone, your taxes. So that's overhead. So that's why a lot of dealerships charge a lot for what they do, because they have large, they got a lot of overhead. If you're working out of your house, you got low overhead. So 
you base it off of that. So you call around, you find out what they charge, and you undercut them a little bit. You don't want to undercut them too much, because once you start making money, you're going to have to raise that price. So you undercut them a little bit. So that's how that works. Same with the labor rate. Call them up again, and talk like a woman when you call them, too. Oh, hi. Uh, what's your labor rate to work on a lawnmower? How much do you charge an hour? Oh, uh, we charge, uh... $75 an hour, ma'am. Oh, okay, that sounds good. All right, well, if I want you to pick up my mower and fix it for $75 an hour, I'll call you back. And then you hang up the phone. And then you go, okay, well, he's charging $75 an hour. I'll charge $65 an hour, because I'm $10 cheaper now. So that's how you do that. That's how you figure out your labor rate and your pickup and delivery. You know, a lot of these shops are structured. You know, they got everything in their, all their ducks are in a row. You can do off of what you think. You know, you don't have to sit there and charge them for every minute of your time. Well, that thing there took me two hours to fix that. So, you know, I'm gonna charge you that two hours. When in reality, if you knew what you were doing, it should have only taken you an hour to do it. So, you know, you don't wanna rip people off either. You want to keep them coming back. This is one valuable thing I learned from my brother Farrell. Sometimes you got to give. And then when you get that customer, you're going to get that money back. So if you got to make a little sacrifice on a job to keep the guy happy, you're going to have him as a customer for life. You're going to get that money back because he's going to keep coming back. And he's going to tell his friends and his neighbors. I spend no money on advertising at my shop. I'm not even in the phone book. And we have so much work, I can't keep up with all of it. I turn work away, we're so busy. Now, granted, when I started out, you gotta advertise a little bit to get your name out there so people know who you are. But once you get established, word of mouth is your best advertising. So always remember that, you know, a guy comes in and. I lost that little clip that holds the wheel on for my lawnmower. You got any of them clips? And I go, yeah, I got those clips. And I go, here, well, what do you want for that? I go, ah, I just have it. They love that when you give them a little nickel dime part. You ain't going to be one of these, oh, well, let me see. Let me look up that clip on my computer. Hmm, yeah, well, that clip is $1.69 and plus tax. So I want $1.69. Just give them the stupid little clip. Or like we do, when we're stripping junk tractors. Save all those little bits and pieces. We got bins full of that stuff. And again, you're going to know what they're looking for. Because we saved those little clips and the little keyways out of the axle. All those little, as they say in England, bits and bulbs. We save all those little bits and bulbs. And you give them to people. And they love that. And they'll come back and you'll get more money out of them. So there. So now let's talk about like used equipment that you may get or junk equipment that you may get. That's money too. That's all money. So you're going to acquire things because people are going to bring in mowers that are just wore out. It's not going to be feasible to fix. They're not going to pay you what it's going to cost to get that thing going. Cause you know, some people, well I had that lawnmower for 15 years, it's been a good mower. Well now it needs a transmission and the motor's smoking, you know, how much money you wanna sink into this thing? Yeah, you're right, I think it's time to buy a new lawnmower. I'll just buy a new one, you can have the old one. Well that old lawnmower got a lot of good parts on there that you could sell. Or maybe you can fix it up. People will give you stuff. I've had people give me tons of equipment because they just wanted it gone. You come to my house, pick up that mower, I bought me a new one. It still runs and stuff, you can have it. And then you get it in your shop and you're like, wow, this thing's pretty nice. All it needs is some belts and that. So if, so if it doesn't need much, you can fix it up and resell it and make some money on it. But what I learned after having this place was I can actually make more money parting out a junk tractor than I can to take my time to try to fix it up and sell it. 
because I got lots of people that come to want to buy parts. We sell a lot of used tires just on the rim. If it's holding air, here you go. You know, that's 15 bucks for a front tire. What do you want for the back one? Give me 25 bucks. Tire and rim, here you go. So there's money. Seat, hoods, transmission. If the engine's good, the engine. Sometimes they'll buy the deck. Maybe their deck's got a bunch of holes wore in it. Here, here I got a deck. Between your deck and this deck, you can make one good deck. You know, we'll sell that too. And then you got the carcass that's left. Well, all them carcasses get loaded up on the trailer and go to the scrapyard. Depending on what scrap's paying, that's money. Same with the lawnmower, old lawnmower blades and chainsaw chains and oil filters. We save all them in barrels because that's metal. And then we take those barrels to the scrapyard and we get scrap money for that stuff. So that all helps to pay for stuff. So that's money. So you're going to have to allot for an area if you start to you know, want to get a regular building to have a little mower junkyard. And then, of course, every year you're going to have to purge that junkyard like we do. Otherwise, you'll just be overrun with stuff. It'll just get out of hand. Every year we just get tons of stuff and then we just got to go through it all, strip it, and get rid of it. But yeah, there's money in that too. Scrap parts, junk parts. Now let's talk about customers and how to treat them when the customer comes in. Now remember that old saying, the customer is always right? The customer isn't always right in this type of business. The customer can send you on a wild goose chase on a repair by explaining to you what's going on. Be polite and listen to them, but let it go in one ear and out the other. You're the one working on it, trust me. Many times they have told me what's wrong with the lawnmower and it wasn't even anywhere near what was wrong with it. If they knew what was wrong with it, they wouldn't be in your shop getting it fixed. So you gotta be nice and be polite and listen to them, but chances are what they're telling you has is relatively 80% of the time isn't what's wrong with it. Unless it's something straightforward, like it doesn't start. Because we get this a lot. What's wrong with your lawnmower? It doesn't start. Okay, it start by, does it crank? Does it crank? Is the flywheel spinning? Do we turn the key or is it like doing nothing? You know, you got to ask a lot of questions to find out. I need a belt, it won't drive. Okay, you mean it won't drive like the mower physically won't drive? Like the wheels won't go along the ground? No, 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 that's fine. The blades won't spin. Okay, well that's a different kind of drive. So you gotta ask a lot of questions, otherwise you're gonna waste a lot of time. Cause your mechanic's gonna come to you, cause you wrote down, tractor won't drive. And he's gonna go, the tractor drives fine. But the blades don't kick on. Oh, well that's what he must have meant by that, yeah. So, make sure you ask a lot of questions and find out. And then get a lot of information from the customer. You know, they're gonna come in, they don't know what engine they got. That's why we did that skit. I love that one too. What's my mower? I play that game every day with customers. People are riding on these lawnmowers four times a month in the springtime. Don't know what brand it is. Don't know what size deck it is. Don't even know what color it is. Question number one. Steve, what color is your lawnmower? Oh man, I, I just used it the other day. Uh, it's a. Uh, I gotta go with. Is I need green? an answer, Steve. Time's running out. Green, green. It's gotta be green. Oh. Ooh. Wrong answer, Steve. The correct answer was red. You got a red lawnmower. I knew I was close. Okay, shock them. <laughs> Isn't that something? You go and buy a piece of equipment and not know anything about it. Well, what size is the deck? Oh, I don't know. I think it's a, I think it's a 22 inch. All right, well, that's a push mower. No, it is a riding mower. Well, how many blades has it got? Hmm, I don't know. I think it's got six blades. No, it don't have six blades. It's gonna have two or three. 
Oh, I don't know. I think it just got warm. So you're going to get a lot of that. But you got to be nice and be polite. But a little advice, they're not always right. And another thing, this is a weather related business depending on where you live. Like we live in the Midwest, so we have mid winters. You know, we experience all, all the seasons, spring, summer, fall. We have a fall season where people are picking up leaves and stuff. And we got winter, if we have a good winter with a lot of snow. I know there's people in parts of the country on the East Coast where you people get hammered with snow. So you do a lot of snow blower repair. We haven't been doing any of that lately. Our winters have been relatively mild. Or if you live in Florida, I know the, the growing season kind of slows down. So people are still cutting grass, but they're not, they're cutting it like once a month instead of four times a month. So, you know, that's a lot of things you got to keep in account too, especially if you live in the area like we do, where you have four seasons. It's kind of hard to, you got to be creative because you got employees. If you got employees and there's no work coming in, you know, you got to still got to pay them people or lay them off. And if they don't, you know, like that, they're going to go find another job that's steady. So you got to come up with ideas on how to, like, call customers on the phone and tell them, hey, we'll come and pick up your lawnmower and, and get it ready for the season. We'll just pick it up for free just to get that work in there to keep your guys busy. So you got to be, you know, you got to think of that too, depending on where you live, how the weather is going to affect your, your business when you're a grass rat. Now let's talk about rechecks. You're like, what, what's a recheck? A recheck is mower that came in for repair, a piece of equipment, went out, supposedly fixed, and the guy's calling in and it comes back. So you gotta look at that. Is it something we did? Did something else break? So again, you gotta, you gotta walk on eggshells with these customers sometimes, you know, and find out what it is. You know, maybe the guy went home and had a gas can that had water in it. Even though he, when he came to pick it up, you told him, yeah, we found water in the, in the carpet trailer. Well, how did water get in there? I don't know how water got in there. And you go, I, I don't know how water got in there, but you had water in the gas. Because you got somebody there forgot to tell him, hey, you might want to check your gas can at home. Probably got water in it. So then you end up having to fix it again. What are you going to do? Are you going to charge him again? It's just going to make him mad. He may not come back. So sometimes you gotta fix it again and then you gotta tell them, well, you gotta check your gas can. It's probably got water in it, dump it out. Otherwise, you're just gonna keep pouring water in there and it ain't gonna run on water. So you gotta look at that. Or you gotta tell them, well, this is a different problem now. You know, you brought it in for this, now this broke. So, you know, maybe you can Kind of make it easy on them a little bit, depending on what it is. You know, you can say, well, you know what, just pay me for this. Because again, if you got them as a customer, they're going to keep coming back and they're going to tend 10 people and those 10 people are going to tell 10 more people and then you're going to be overwhelmed with work and then you're going to wish that you would have charged them the first time. No, I'm just joking. But no, that's what you want to do. That's part of customer service there. You got to, got to, Watch the rechecks. Make sure it's something that you didn't do or didn't overlook. Or maybe you did overlook it. Well then, and it needs another part. Maybe you can do like we do sometimes. You know what, just pay me for the part. We won't charge you any labor. You know, we should have put that part on. And my guy forgot. I'll, I'll beat him up later, you know, whip him, smash his fingers later, my mechanic for not doing that. So, and then that makes him feel better too, knowing that you're gonna beat up your mechanic later. So another thing you're gonna to have to look at is, are you gonna have some kind of computer program to do your billing and stuff with? That can get expensive, very expensive. Again, that falls under the category of overhead for your business, and when you're starting out, you wanna keep that overhead low. You wanna keep your low overhead as low as possible because that puts more money in your pocket. So you may wanna just start out with good old fashioned, writing them out, invoices that you could buy online and then just do them by hand and keep track of them that way or you can buy 
uh, like QuickBooks. QuickBooks has got some programs that you can tailor to have invoices and it'll keep track. It can get a little expensive too. So carefully look at the ones they have and see if you can get the cheapest one that'll fit you. Because they have ones that'll actually do your payroll and stuff for QuickBooks. And then there's some other ones out there for bigger shops, but again, it can get, it can run real expensive. Thirty, forty thousand dollars some of these shops pay for a program that comes in with the scanners and all that for barcodes and stuff. That's fine once you get big and on your feet. But again, you want to keep that overhead low. You want to do things on the cheap. This is another thing I see with people that start businesses right away. They go and they spend a lot of money on t-shirts and uniforms and having their truck all lettered up and everything and it's like you haven't even got one customer yet and you're spending all this money on that that's fine if you want to do that but get started first get rolling baby steps baby little baby steps that's what you want to start because you don't want to get in trouble financially and have a big debt hanging over your head that you got to pay back especially like I mentioned before seasonal where you live there's going to be times in the winter it's going to be lean you're not going to have that money coming in like it does in the spring and summer so you got to keep all that into a, into account so baby steps just remember little little tiny baby steps to get started keep that overhead low keep that in your mind constantly your overhead what am i paying to do business what's it costing me how can i make it cheaper because you gotta have insurance, you gotta have all kinds of stuff. And it adds up, it adds up fast. You gotta shop around. Keep that in, the, in, in, you know, in your head. We do all our parts look up online. It's all free. You got all these free websites where you can look up parts. Just Google, Google search stuff. You can find anything. We do that a lot. Guy come in with a model number. We're trying to find it. We can't find it, so we'll just Google it. Cup Cadet tractor, this model, and I put parts after it. Bloop, everything pops up. Oh, here's one, click on it. There's the diagram of that tractor right there. There's the part. Very simple. Doesn't cost you nothing but your internet connection. And then you can do your billing, like I said, by hand at first until you get up and running, got some money coming in. Then you might want to invest in a better program like QuickBooks or one of these other ones where they'll tailor make it for your business so there's your dinner on that so to sum it up you know it's a lot of hard work be prepared to work long hours at first you know you can slack off at some point because you're your own boss maybe you're stuck in a job you don't like uh, punching a clock anymore or having that boss's foot on your neck you want to work for yourself that's what's most satisfying about it. You're working for yourself. You're your own boss. You got to answer to nobody but yourself. If you're late for work, you just got to go in the bathroom and stare in the mirror and yell at yourself. You're late for work. You better not be late again. You're going to get in trouble. I'm going to fire you if you weren't the boss. I'd fire you. That's what you got to do every morning if you're late. So you're the boss. It's a different kind of work. Trust me. When you work for yourself, you can work as many hours as you want. You can work as least hours as you want. It depends on how driven you are. But you'll find out it's different because you you know you know that you know oh I got I gotta go to work and listen to that boss now and I gotta do all this stuff and I got all this other stuff I gotta do and hey when you work for yourself it's a whole different game. The clock it flies by. You know maybe you're one of them people where you got a job where you're a clock watcher you're like. Is it lunchtime yet? Is it break time yet? I don't take any breaks during the day. Well, unless I gotta go make a poop face. I take a break then, but other than that, we don't have like structured break times and stuff. We take a you know break when we can, stop BS for a minute, and then it's back to work. But yeah, it's a different kind of work. Nothing like working for yourself. So I hope this answers any questions for any of you grass rats out there that are thinking about starting your own business. And I hope it helped you. And as always, there's your dinner. Woo! Starting your own business. Woo!